All good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this special meeting of the Denver Board, Board, Township, uh, Board of Education on October 3rd. This meeting of the Denville Township Board of Education is being held in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Notice of this meeting was provided to the Daily Record and or the Star Ledger of Morris County. It has been delivered to the Township Clerk and has been posted on the bulletin board of the Board of Education Office and of each of these school buildings in the district. Roll call, please. Mr. Addison? Mr. Cass? Here. Mrs. DeLuna? Here. Mrs. Lindsay? Here. Mr. Lohr? Yeah. Mrs. Wepner? Here. Mr. Capella. Here. Now, we do our own pledge of allegiance here, correct? Yeah. Flags out, sorry. Flags out, sorry. Here we go. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. state of our facilities, our enrollment, with an eye towards eliminating some standard space, instructional space in our schools, including the use of trailers for students, and planning for our future. To provide some brief background before Steve's presentation, in the last 18 months, we've completed a facility room usage study on all of our buildings, a demographic study of population trends in the town, and the impact that we might have on enrollment, and most recently, a comprehensive five-year strategic plan with strong community involvement. As part of this process, the board identified several options for renovating and or adding on to our facilities. Some of the projects were aimed solely at eliminating the use of some standard space, and other larger options would have been substantial additions that would have been provided some room for further population growth that our demographic study showed is likely to occur in the next five years. The board reviewed all of these options, and this spring and early summer, we were seriously evaluating an addition to Riverview School, which would have required a roughly $10 million referendum and would have eliminated our use of substandard space throughout the district, as well as providing some space for future growth and enrollment. While the board was having those conversations, the various developments the town is now working through, starting with the Redmond Press project, came to our attention. After some informative and productive meetings with the town administration, the board felt there were too many questions about the size, the timing, and the scope of these projects for us to be confident that a Riverview expansion project alone would, have been, would be sufficient, and we were frankly afraid we would be building something that would be inadequate as soon as it was complete if all the developments being proposed came to pass. In light of these concerns, the board felt that this presentation is important so we can inform the council and community, community at large about the current capacity of our schools and to offer information you hopefully can use when considering developers' plans and what they mean in terms of increases in student enrollment in our schools and the costs associated with those increases. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve, and then hopefully after we can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, for the general public, if you're not sure, my name is Steve Forte. I'm the superintendent of the Denville School District. This is my fourth year in Denville, my seventh year as a superintendent altogether. I also live in town about a block away and have two children, two school-aged children, so I have a pretty big stake in all this stuff too. First of all, just again, I want to thank you for allowing us to come in here and take a portion of your meeting just to give you information. We know you have a heart, you have hard decisions to make in the future, and we're not here to try to tell you how to make them. We just want you to, when, when I walk out of here, I want everybody to understand, you know, the, the impact of whatever decisions are made 
what will happen to the districts in terms of our populations. So just a quick review. So since 2014, the district has, has really spent a lot of money from the budget, not from referenda, but from the budget, to, to make needed repairs to the schools. Just a few things. We've, we've spent two, two, almost $2.5 two million on new sections of roofing throughout the district, site work, repairs, bathrooms. We conducted what's called an ESIP plan, which is a... Um, an energy savings plan that allows you to leverage the savings to pay for the for the uh, upgrades. We've done, we've re renovated and reconfigured two of our three libraries. The third one is on schedule for this summer, which actually was more about reconfiguring the library to pick up classroom space. And we've done a lot of work with our um, network and Wi-Fi. We also provide free free lunches for economically disadvantaged children, and we are funding a, funding a homework help program at Peer Place. Um, and and all, all told, since 2014, those, pro, those programs are almost $7 million. All of those programs, again, were completed without any additional funding, only through the budget, and from grants, meaning like our, our federal grants and state grants. One other point is the district the last of the debt from the, from the Denville School District will expire in 2019. So our, when our bonding went out from the additions at Lakeview in the late 1990s, the, uh, all of that will expire in 2019. We, won't, we do not, at this time, have plans to take on future debt. We spent a good portion of last year working with 120 plus stakeholders throughout the district, including including people from the township, the township government, and uh, the police, all different people, community people, school teachers, even, even some students were involved to help create this strategic plan, which we call Denville 2022. And we came up with our four goals. You can see the fourth goal, not that the other ones aren't important, but I'm really here to talk about our facilities, is to create safe and secure learning environment equipped to deliver 21st century educational expectations using efficient and sustainable facilities district-wide. So we have a goal that deals mostly with our, our facilities. This next slide talks about our challenges in history. So when our, and I'm going to get to a slide a little later on our, on our enrollment in the past and over since, two, since uh, 1979. You'll see it's almost like a roller coaster. So back in 2006, when there was a big influx of, people, of students coming in, the district at that time had already con already completed the, the large addition at Lakeview, and at that time they did not feel like we should go out for another referendum. I, I shouldn't say we because I wasn't involved. At that time, the board decided not to go out for another referendum, but to use utilize things like trailers and other substandard space. The other substandard space we use are dual use space, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. It's like where you have two classrooms um, at the same time. No. I don't know why that went off. Maybe you got to touch it. Yeah. So you have two two classrooms, two classes going on at the same time in the same room, you know, with two different teachers teaching something else. We also have four. We also have four classes that need bathrooms. That, according to codes, we have a couple things we have to work on with that. Here's a picture of what it looks like. That was a was an excellent shot one of our vice principals took. You can see there's a two classes, a teacher on the right trying to teach a small group class and a teacher on the left teaching a small group class at the same time. The wall that's there is only about uh, three quarters away to the ceiling because you can't put a wall without two exits and all that. So we just, it's kind of a, a half wall or three quarter wall. It doesn't stop the sound. So these are, these are what the, the county and the state consider, consider to be substandard space. Uh, in our district, we have trailers at all three schools. Because of the, the, recon, the reconfiguration of the libraries and some other things that we did within the building envelope, we were able to eliminate the use of trailers at Valley View last year for students and at Riverview this year for students. We still have the trailers. Staff use them. We use them for storage, but we do not use them for student instruction. Next year, the plan is to work on the Lakeview Library and eliminate that. As you see, this is a picture of Lakeview, and during the day, both trailers are utilized for teaching, for instruction, and that's been since 
2006. According to that state code that I put up there, it's temporary instructional space like that is only supposed to be used for two years with a maximum of three-year renewal. So a five-year maximum, and we're, you know, this is from 2006, so this is why we're in a situation where we need to do something. Um, we, we work with a demographer, his name is Ross Haber. He works all throughout the, the state. He's working with Rockaway Township recently. He's been um, in um, Monroe. If you know anything about Monroe Township, it's really growing. So he's working with a lot of different towns throughout the state. He also works in, um, in New York State as well. He, he did this projection for me. So rather than have, rather than pick on a specific projection because it seems like it changes all the time, I wanted to give you an example of what would happen. So if, if, if the decision was to allow for 300 units to be built in the town, anywhere, wherever it is, and at a 15% co-op rate with 100 rentals and 200 condos. Again, this is not any particular one, it's just, it's just a sample. When all said and done, there would be, according to this, this study, and this is a scientific study based on a lot, so it could have some variances, um, you'd have 64 students come out of the 100 rentals and 187 come out of the 200 sales. So a total of 251 students out of the 300 units could be expected with the configuration I gave you. The 226 would be expected to be in K-8, and if you look, I show you why that is. This is a, this is a, you know, they, they, they use this all around the state, so it's, it's not an exact thing, but it's, it's what would be expected. 70% K-5, 20% middle school, 10% high school. So it would have an impact of 226 students K-8, 25 in the high school, and uh, 251 total from that 300 unit that I just mentioned. On the right side, up there, you can see our current class sizes. And at the bottom, I put our board policy as to what our class limits are. So the K-1 classes in the district, our limit is 23 students. Grades 2 through 5, the limit is 26. And grades 6 through 8 is 29. So if you see, if, if you divide, again, this would just be if you, if you had an exact distribution that worked out exactly, that every, every grade had 30 kids in it, it would, in some of our grades, it would go over our limits. We also don't, we, at this time, considering what we're going to do this year, we will have no more room to do anything within our building envelope to even split a class if we wanted to. This is the, the enrollment history since 1979. I wanted to show you because it, you can see it's gone, it started high, it's gone down, it's gone up, it's gone down, and at the end, it's pretty much leveling off with a slight increase. Our demographer said that our, our numbers are gonna pretty much stay steady with a possible slight increase. So this last sheet I just wanted to put up here was uh, some facts. The enrollment has gone down, but is now leveling off. FTK stands for full-time kindergarten. So the addition of full-time kindergarten added, added the need for four classrooms with bathrooms. And I want to give you a little data on, on the success of the full-time kindergarten. First of all, 80% of the schools in New Jersey do have full-time full kindergarten. And prior to full-time kindergarten in Denver, less than 20% of our kindergarten students read on grade level when entering grade one. So it's, it's like the, the, the minimum what you should be at entering grade one. We had 20% of our students going into grade one reading at that level. With the addition of full-time kindergarten, that number is now 90%. Now, the time that we spent in half-time kindergarten is actually equal to the entire literacy block they get. So really, by the, in, by the in, uh, introduction of the full time and adding all that extra time, it's, it's actually equivalent, the literacy block is equivalent to what they were getting the whole time in a half day kindergarten. So it really has um, shown some tremendous uh, statistical improvements in our reading, in our literacy. 
Now, we have pre-K, and we don't have a pre-K that's, we don't have the kind of pre-K that's for all students. This is a, a pre-K that's mandated for special ed students. You can either, you can either have a class yourself or you can send kids out of district. So we have, we at one time, only five, six years ago, we had one pre-K, now we have three. The laws keep changing. The way that we identify students and what, what we're required to offer them, it changes. So now we've gone, like I said, from one, one pre-K to four. Each one of those four pre-Ks needs a bathroom. I bring that up because it's important to note that we, don't, we have three of them currently in rooms that don't have bathrooms. So, you know, you see kids about this tall walking around the hallway. It's, it's not really a safe situation, so we're going to work on that this summer. Um, we've had to add new special education classes, just the way, it's the way it works out. You, you have a certain limit and you have to split the class. Um, again, I already mentioned this, but we are, we are planning to do the third library renovation at Lakeview to add two regular classrooms to the, to the, to the uh, facility. And this was going to be decided, as Dino said, rather than a $10 million referendum. So basically, after, after our strategic planning, which was important, we, went, we wanted to do this first. Because we, we talked with the public. We got everybody's input. We actually did a survey. What came back was, we should fix this. We should not have anything. I mean, we're the number nine town in the state, according to New Jersey Magazine. We don't want to have the word substandard linked with Denville. I know you just said all the pride we have here. We don't really want to use the word substandard when we talk about Denville. So we took this and we decided, what are we going to do to fix it? And the decision really was, could we, could we do a small addition at Lakeview where the population was, or should we really fix the problem, do a larger addition at Riverview, and move some kids from Lakeview to Riverview? That really was the better idea. Because Lakeview is about double the size of Riverview, and it really, I would have a real hard time recommending any growth to Lakeview. It's already one of the largest elementary schools that you're, that you're gonna find. So it wasn't really the option. So we, it came down to really, a $10 million referendum, the, cho the choices were pretty easy. It was one, do nothing, which to me, I felt like that was not even an option. <clears throat> Two, in addition at Lakeview, that really wasn't a great option either. Three, do the, do the uh, addition at Riverview and, uh, for about $10 million. Or the, the fourth thing, after the board, the board really pushed back at the whole idea of we're, it's uncertain time, so maybe we need to have a fourth idea. The fourth idea was to do the reconfiguration of the Lakeview Library. There's a couple other things to do, but rather than a $10 million job, it's some, gonna be somewhere around a million dollars or 900,000, which we have money for that in our reserves to cover. So one of the things I really wanna stress is that underlying, that underlying word, uh, phrase up there. It says, there is no more space in our current building envelope. Meaning if, if we need to absorb kids, into that class configuration I showed you, there's just no more room to put them. Rather than, unless we want to start having classrooms again in substandard space. And just to clarify, our per pupil cost for 2017-18 is $17,149 per student. Now, you'll see different figures for that. And the reason why you're gonna see different figures for that, that's our actual cost. But it's not a comparative cost. The reason why there's a difference between actual and comparative is because some districts don't have busing. Busing costs a lot of money. So it's hard to compare a busing district with a non-busing district. So if you see another number as the comparative cost, if you're going to try to compare Denville with like Mars Plains where they have less busing, that's, that's the reason why you might see those. And that's the last slide for me. And um, if it's permitted, I'd be happy to answer questions from anybody in the council or whoever else you want to do. Um, it's up to you. So what uh, we do is open up the public portion to let the public ask you questions about this presentation and uh, specifically this presentation. Then when they finish, we'll, we'll let the council members comment and ask questions about the presentation. Great. I'll All right. right here. Thank you. So would anybody from the public like to come up and address the Board of Education or the council about any Topics on this presentation. Yeah. Mr. Bridget, please state your name and address for record. Raise you in eight Pleasant Valley. Average age of your schools, do you know? 70 plus, right? Yeah, they're the ones built in the 250s, one of the 60s. 250s, one of the 60s. So the six plus million you guys invested recently, 
infrastructure, but not really hard infrastructure, right? I mean, we are we are completely maxed out in terms of capacity in any building in any classroom. Yes. So what's your option? We'd have to increase the building envelope, so we'd have to do some type of building, either a new school, depending on how much new construction is built, or additions, maybe a combination of both. How long would it take you to build a new school? Well, I mean, we're nowhere near this phase yet to even. But how long? I mean, from right now to having a new school built, um, I would say at least three years. That'd be a minimum to have it built. One more question, we'll step away. So if whatever gets passed, possibly for an expansion of housing in this town, it gets built within one or two years, you'd have to, you'd have to in parallel with that, start building a school almost immediately. Well, the thing is, I, you know, that's a, that's a tough question to answer, only because the kids don't come like the first day that the schools are built, that they don't get filled with kids. Right. So it's a little bit of a slower process, but you would have, at, at the very least, to answer your question is you better have some plans and be ready to move on it because it's not like you can wait unless you want to start going back to trailers. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else from the public like to come up and address them? Sir, come on up. Hi, I'm Nick. I uh, live in Nicole Drive, 64. Like I said, I've spoken here. Excuse once. me, sir. Nick Zumis, Nicole Drive, Super Nicole Drive. Um, first time, second time here, spoke last time. That was kind of the numbers guy. I don't know if you remember that. And so, uh, one of the questions I had is um, I looked at the COA mandates, and some of that was actually in this study. And it uh, looks like you're planning for another maybe two or 300 um, kids approximately, right? And um, when I look at the COA numbers, um, one thing that we should know, I, it took me about a minute to look at their spreadsheet at, on, on the fair share site. And on fair share, it vastly overestimates how many low income folks that uh, uh, accommodations we need to make. For example, um, if you had a Three or four hundred thousand dollar house, and you just happen to move higher into like a better neighborhood because you like our schools, and you happen to spend thirty one percent of your income on housing. According to the fair share, you are a low income person, and so that low income person gets counted against us for against the COA potential. All these you know models are from one twelve to twelve hundred. All these all these vastly um, different numbers. And that middle class household then would have to then pay. They won't, they won't take advantage. They won't be considered one of the low income people that would move here. They would, be, they would actually have to then pay through increased taxes and referenda, bonds, etc., to um, support what they were, you know, the thing that they were counted for. They won't even take, be a beneficiary of it. So let's say in a realistic worst case situation, we're talking maybe two or 300 kids. And I'm all for fixing the school's envelope, you know, development, upgrades, put in programs for more teachers, better, you know, family, uh, you know, uh, programs. But in the end, the new construction of schools in this country has been about $14 billion in 2014. Eight billion of them were on new schools. Sadly, no negligible difference in student performance. And there's a lot of other things from educational um, uh, organizations that send a lot of different um, information, and I'm all for the environment being satisfied but when we're talking about a new school, for example, the new school on the Colt that was proposed last time, the total cost of that school, if you can actually build it for the same price that you built it back then, the total cost, I'm not talking about the monthly cost, like you would go into buy a car and say, hey, it's only $300 a month, that's your, you know, better cost. Total cost would be over $100 million. 
to the, you know, and that's about twenty thousand dollars of debt for every household in Denville, and that's for two or three hundred students potentially. This is all speculative. We're all talking about speculation because we don't know for sure. But I just want to, you know, just put it out there about the cost and some of the options and. Um, the, the hard work that the school has done should not be overlooked. I think improvements to what we have are overdue, and you know I think a lot of people support that. I think taking that next leap, if all these construction projects occur, all of them, okay, you can very easily get to almost a quarter of a billion dollars of extra infrastructure costs over 30 years. You know, this these are significant costs to this to the to the town of only 6,500 households. So that's my comment. I don't have a specific question, but I just wanted to throw those numbers out there just in case that, um, someone hasn't been paying attention. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else from the com uh, public like to uh, comment or question? I would like to ask that if you do, uh, for our council meetings, and, and this is a board of meeting, we'd like to try to keep the questions and comments to about three to five minutes. Make sure everyone gets a chance to comment. Mr. Grant. John Smith, a trip near my way up. Uh, Bob Grant, 114 Bridgewood Parkway East in Lake Arrowhead. If I'm understanding your presentation, uh, Steve. You based your additional student populations on about 300 units. Right. Uh, 100 rental, 200. Okay. The Denville housing plan that the administration and the council submitted to the court calls for 375 units. So I'm just wondering, you know, my math says that's a 25% increase over your estimates. Would that be a fair extrapolation of the numbers that you put up there? Well, the problem is, the reason why I wanted to use a sample is because there's so many different things that could go on within the numbers. Meaning, like, if there's if there's an additional 75 one-bedroom units, you have really no, no, no increase. But, uh, for example, in the in the presentation that Rand Associates made uh, before the council, that's the Toll Brothers. Right. Uh, 150 unit. Uh, it started off as 150 units. Uh, I believe it presented to the council at 116 units, and they said there would be 92, three and four bedroom units when the uh, attorney for Graham was questioned. So that would up those numbers. And I, and I agree with you. A lot of this is is what if kind of uh, numbers crunching because we don't yeah. <coughs> the only, Excuse me. The only thing that's been built is the 100 units over at SLA. So, you know, everything else is, is kind of, you know, what if kind of thing. But since Denville asked the court to approve this plan, it seems to me that's a, a you know, that, that's, it's fair to anticipate that number of housing units with those number of bedrooms. The Glenmont Commons uh, has got 42 uh, three bedroom units in it. So we may be looking at, at instead of 250 uh, kids, we may be looking at 300, 325, somewhere around there. Um, I just wanted to be clear on that. And, and for the council, one of the things in the special master's report that I found very curious, uh, actually two things. One was that the special master said that in calculating uh, some of his uh, requirement for affordable housing, that the calculations from Denville to the court did not follow Denville's steep slope ordinance when it was calculating the number of units on steep slope. So, you know, it's something that you might take a look at and see, you know, why that happened. You know, we're paying experts to be expert, and, you know, if they make a mistake and don't follow our own ordinances in offering calculations to the to the court, I think that presents a, 
uh, when I was a newspaper reporter, the editor used to tell me if you got one thing wrong in the story, the whole story is questionable. So, you know, I just suggest that the council take a look at that. And the other thing is, in that special master's report, there's a comment <clears throat> that in June there was a presentation from Lennar Holmes, which is a major developer in the area, a presentation for 150 units above the train station on and off Thurmont Road. And was that presentation made to the council? And I'd like to remind you, we were talking here about the Board of Education. Right, I know, but it affects, you know, if there's another 150 units that the council's heard about that, that, that are in the mix, you know, that obviously affects what's going on here. But, you know, this was not, you know, Lanier did not make a presentation to the council? On no, they did not, sir. Okay. Lanier did make a motion to intervene. They, but, yes, I know, and it was accepted. Well, but they were allowed to intervene, yes. Hey, your pardon? They were allowed to intervene. Right, it was accepted by the court. To the intervener status. The presentation was probably the motion to intervene in those proceedings. Okay, because I was confused and I wasn't sure who the key may have presented to. Okay, thank you. If I may, I just want to add one thing to what Mr. Grant said. Um, the, this kind of hypothetical presentation that Steve did, it's hypothetical. We obviously don't have a strong opinion or we don't have any idea how many units are going to be built at the end of the day. The important thing that the board wanted to get across was the difference between, let's say, a one-bedroom unit generating zero students in a, in a co-rental versus 1.26 for a three-bedroom. To us, that's really the, the really critical point here, the difference between what, what these developments will look like in terms of their, their build-out, one-bedroom, two-bedroom, three-bedroom. So those numbers are very significant to us, and that's really the point that you know, we wanted to make it as clearly as possible, so I felt the great repeat. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. President, if I, if I might. I just want to put it on the record here, if everybody understands, that that property for the last six years had been coming to the administration asking for, um, asking to develop that property from developments of up to 300 units and I've rejected them every time. And that when they did it, they, they did, they did um, go to the courts and, um, and to, to seek to become an intervener as we objected on the grounds that they missed the deadline to become an intervener. And the court unfortunately didn't agree with this. So you're talking about the property of the Thermont, right? Or the yeah, what, we, what, what we locally, these local people call the own property. Yeah. And the, we have um, rejected their proposals. Over the last six years. The administration has rejected their ideas over the last six years. Eight, ten times. And we tried preventing them from becoming an intervener, but the court did not side with us, right? right? Okay. Um, sir? My name is Bernard Kocha. I live on Smith Road. Uh, thank you for this report. I know sir, I'm sorry. Bernard Kocha, 72 Smith Road. Thank you. A lot of work goes into a report like this, and thank you for sharing this with uh, all of us. Did your report take into anything, any other considerations outside of infrastructure, such as increased uh, hiring of teachers to accommodate these additional te uh, these additional students? No, it did not. Did it take into consideration increased infrastructure surrounding buses and bus drivers? No. Did it take into consideration increased traffic on some of these properties, these locations where these developments are, are uh, being proposed? No. Thank you. Anybody else from the uh, public? In the back. Sir, we 19 Copeland Road. Good evening. I have a question on the demographic study that you had presented. There's someone to make sure I understand what you were presenting. So when you had said that we have leveled off and it seems to be a leveling rate, did that include the development or did not include the development? That did not include development. So can I infer from that study 
that if the development, if there was no development, and the needs for the school system would be much, much less, and the cost that you were projecting would be much, much less, or the still, or we are still talking about a cost of an increase. <clears throat> okay, so without, without new construction, we feel we can shoehorn the kids in without substandard space. The additional addition of what I showed here, 251 students, we do not believe we can accommodate within our current building envelope. So if I can then take that inference that you're speaking to, and if by God's will, the Denville Township decides we will build our code requirements just for the code requirements, and that will be a number, and we're not going to talk hypotheticals, a number. Obviously, that number would be less, and therefore the cost to the citizens of Denville would be less as well. Is that a correct statement? Well, I, if, it's, if it's just a certain, if it's a less number, I think it would. I can't tell you exactly because the configuration of the, of the units that would be built makes a big difference, meaning according to our demographer, I'll give you an example, as a one-bedroom COA for, for sale yields 0.2 students, and a three-bedroom COA for sale yields 1.5 students. So depending on the configuration of, of the development that you're talking about, we have a big difference in how many kids come out. So therefore, if the requirement is a certain number of co-units, not necessarily the number of bedrooms, and, and then we'll say, we're going to build all one bedroom units, that's permissible. Assuming that to be the case, then it's not a direct correlation, it's actually much, much less if that was done that way. Is that a correct statement? According, yeah, according to the data we have, that would yield much less like a one, if it was all one bedroom compared to three bedroom. And if we had all one bedrooms built that way, then based upon, let's use your hypothetical number, and I'll pick 300 units as a number, all one bedroom, would we be able to then shoehorn them into what we have presently without increasing or building the so according to our demographer, 300 one-bedroom units would yield approximately 60 students. 60 students, if they were spread properly, I gave you the, I give you our spread right now, we may be able to fit them in. There might be a couple that would be difficult, but 60 is a lot less than 250. Thank you. Charles Body, 73 Mount Pleasant Turnpike. Is this going to be your this presentation going to be on your website? Yes, it'll be on our website and it will be it's video, so yeah. the video will be on the website and it will go out in our Friday folder. Okay, how about the demographic study? Is that already on there? That's on there. Okay, great. I just wanted to be sure because it's kind of hard to see and understand this right. if you haven't been involved in it and it gives the public a chance to do that. Thanks very much. Council President, if, if the mayor and I were, were speaking, um, if uh, I don't mean to put John Jensen on the spot, but with respect to the comments of all one bedroom co units, do you happen to know the formula? I, I know there's a percentage of one, percentage of two, percentage of three. I, I don't have that. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact formula, but you're correct. You cannot build all one bedroom units. The, the housing code requires a certain number of three bedrooms, a certain number of two bedrooms, a certain number of one bedroom, depending on the total number of units being constructed. <clears throat> Anybody else who hasn't spoken yet for the first time? If not, we'll go to the music region. Okay. Oh, Catherine Valentino, 43 Esling Lake Road. I'm wondering if we know now what our responsibility is for COA units, as we didn't when the units were built across the street from me. We don't. Okay. So again, we have a hypothetical presentation. We don't know what our responsibility is, and we're talking about more development, and now possibly a $100 million burden for a school 
when we don't, still do not know what our responsibility of co-units is to the state. How does this benefit Denville and its residents? So I'll correct my answer a little bit. Do we know our absolute number? No, but we feel we know the floor and we know the max, and we feel relatively certain the number will be in between the two. And what is that number in between? It was the same question when I asked I, I don't know where well, the number was. Well, you can tell me how tall the building across the street from me was going to be. And I asked that question four or five times. It's all transcribed. Here we are in another situation where I feel like questions are not, there's no hard number yet. Correct. How come we're developing and developing and developing when we still don't know what our responsibility is and we live with these? They're here. We are irrevocably changing our town. Is like. that to the town's benefit? So let me uh, try two things. One, why are we doing this? We've talked about it several times at, at recent meetings, but I'd like to not answer that now because this time is dedicated to the Board of Education. This, I feel this is directly, so, this presentation wouldn't be happening if we weren't developing. Is that not directly related? You know what, the Board of Education does present to us and the public regularly. The Board of Education does plan for growth and do demographic studies periodically. Right. So I think that this presentation and presentations like it may have occurred in the past and they will occur again in the future with or without development. So I will repeat my request that, and we'll have, we will have an open public portion for anything you want else you want to talk about. But for this, I'd like it to be dedicated to the slides and the comments presented by Mr. Forte and Mr. Capello. Will there be an answer to my questions this evening? To the best of my ability, I think so, yes. I mean, but I, I cannot give you the exact... Tell me what the hard numbers no, are. No, it doesn't exist. Then why are we building? All right, so let's go. Would anybody else in the public think... Why are we building if we don't know what our obligation is? Can I make a clarification, too? Because I, I don't want data out there that's not accurate or that's uncertain. We, we're throwing around a $100 million number, and that's never been studied or talked about. So. Please don't just take that for a fact. I, I, we don't have any idea what we would build, where we would build it, and the cost of such building. I know there was plans a few years, and I can't really talk about it because I wasn't here then to build a school, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that we have never done any studies or talked about it, so we have no idea the cost of the school or what we would build. All right, would anybody else from the public like to address any of these slides, part of the presentation? of the Board of Education this evening? Mr. Brescia, Mr. Brescia and first, then. I have to take under a minute. Um, thank you, Parisian 8 Pleasant Valley Road. Uh, you know, I, I had written you, and you know my respect for everything you do, and the Board of Education, you know, we all know the work. I think aside from the numbers, if, if you can take one thing from all of this, the overarching principle here, which might have to be modified is, Perhaps the council can basically take where they are and reset and include the Board of Education much more closely than you have. I know there's a long-standing tradition, as I've written you, that says, you know, the board does their thing, the council does their thing, and we respect that. But I think at this juncture, the process probably needs to be modified slightly, and we need to have a much more close integration with the Board of Education. It might give some heft to what you do or don't want to do. And I think that's part of what's going on here. I know they've been trying to get to you since May or so, and now they're here, and you guys are down the road a little bit, and we get that. But if you could give that some consideration, I'd be grateful. I think that's, uh, that might be a positive approach and something that's slightly slightly different. So, you know, I respect you guys, and I appreciate the work you do, but we need to do something different. There's no doubt about it. So. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, did you want to come back? I do, since I was corrected in making the hypothetical assumption that I did, and I accept the correction. However, we are working with hypothetical assumptions. So rather than do that and to take the correction to heart, I would suggest that the board and the council look at what we think our number is, whatever that number is, and do the calculation according to what and determine how many one bedroom, how many two bedroom, and how many three bedrooms we need in total, not with builder's remedy attached to it, and then look at the board to turn around and say, now what will that cost us? So we have a real number. 
and understand the rhythm. So the, the correction is accepted, and now I put it back to you to do what you need to do. Thank you. Would anybody else uh, from the public like to address the council or the board? Mr. Grant? Bob Grant, Lake Arrowhead. Um, one of the things that, that I've asked the council uh, in past meetings for is to consider the overall development and its impact on the community. And these comments are directed to this presentation, right? Right, right. Well, if you want me to wait, I'll go back and sit down. But what I was, just very briefly, what I was going to suggest is you've heard from the schools. There are several other aspects of infrastructure which are going to be impacted by development of this magnitude. Police, fire protection, uh, traffic, uh, potable water, sewage, and so forth. So I think it would be extremely useful in keeping with John Peradian's suggestion that you bring the Board of Education a little more deeply into the process, is that we get presentations from those other affected areas of the infrastructure so that at the end of that process, the town, your, the town council, the administration, and the public knows what it's dealing with. Nick Zumas, uh, Nicole Dry. I'm looking at the um, actual um, demographers report, and so the all the projections I see of our 2022 requirements are actually less than the enrollment that we had in 2012, 10 years ago, 10 years prior. Is that correct? Can you say that again? The projection in the demographers report, giving some of these um, assumptions still has the overall enrollment of the school in the year, the out year 2022. It's still less than the population enrollment from 2012. Is that correct? I'll show it to you, it's right there. It doesn't have these don't have but no, no, that's the, right. That's the demographer's report, right. and there is some, some assumptions in there. So if you look at it, there's a COA, you know, report statement right at the beginning of that report. Okay. All right. So just so it's still less. Right. It's according to the demographer's report. That's why I'm just asking the question. So one one of the things you have to consider about that is we use our space very differently than we did even just a few years ago. Um, Steve talked a little bit about this. Uh, we have full we have full day kindergarten. Uh, which will double the size of the, or double the number of, of sections we have in the classroom. Yeah, between kindergarten and pre-K, we, we went up, we went up seven rooms, seven full-size rooms. We also have a greater need for special education classes. So you're talking about resource rooms, you're talking about small instruction rooms. We're not sitting a teacher in front of 40 kids anymore that are in nice neat rooms. So the way we use the schools are different and they're more intense. So we are at, you know, we've been wrestling with this for several years, even when we were looking at somewhat declining moments, we were still looking at greater utilization of our buildings. So that's important to keep in mind. Yep. All right, at this point in time, I'd like to close the public portion on the Denville Board of Education presentation and ask the uh, council members who have questions or comments, if they have any. Mr. <coughs> Murphy? Thank you, Council President. Um, I've looked at this in that last remark. I, I think I agree with that the uh, the end of the 2022 would be something like uh, an additional um, couple of hundred students, but it would still be below the peak uh, of, I believe, the 2007 8 uh, year. Uh, one of the things that I asked uh, when I was at the foundation, and Dino, I think I asked you, and I know I definitely asked Michael Anderson, we have uh, three, uh, let's call them high density uh, uh, sites in town: the Forges, Berkshire Hills, and Essling Village. And I would, I would like to have seen a slide included here as to the students that come from those developments and the makeup of those developments, as compared to uh, our plans submitted to the courts to meet our fair share obligation. I, I think, you know, I. I've lived through the schools. My, my daughter has, uh, 
has gone to all of dental schools. I remember back when Dr. Clark uh, had a demographer, and the demographer said that we really needed to have another school, and, and that, that was over, uh, based on my backtracking on your calendar, that, that was back in the 2003-2004, uh, before you were here, Mr. Forte, and, and those demographer studies didn't bear out. So I, I, I think we've got actual history, and, and I, I would like to see the board develop a slide based on the actual history, uh, rather, rather than, you know, it might help to remove some of the speculation. I, um, I really applaud you guys for uh, coming here. Um, I think this information is great. Um, I, I guess the one thing that I want to say uh, to the public, you know, we, we keep talking about COA, and we're acting as if COA is driving school expansion. And, and certainly when we look at your slide, um, you know, COA is driving development, which has the knock-on effect of driving school potential development. Um, it's, it's a very complex issue, and I think one of the things at the end of the issue, and as you try to separate the different silos of the issue, you know, the courts don't care about our schools. They really don't. And whereas we have to make a, 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 a valid attempt to meet our COA obligation, and that may drive some of the development that increases the, um, uh, the enrollment, you know, it's, I think the decision is separate and distinct. Yes, it has an impact. I recognize that impact, as Mr. Grant pointed out, to this infrastructure, to the police, to everybody else. And we recognize that impact, but the courts don't care about it. And that's the quandary that we in the council find ourselves in. Thank you for your presentation and your time. Uh, yeah, uh, two, one thing, if you don't mind. Actually, I want to just circle back to this link for a second. Um, I, we have those numbers. We can obviously give you the, the numbers for each of the developments. One thing I want to point out is, um, for Esalen Lake particularly, um, all along the development, I think Mr. Friedman might back me up on this, is it was always presented that Esalen Lake would uh, turn out basically zero children to, to, because of the configuration of the number, seven, number seven. We, right, well, that's exactly right. Our demographer actually called for between seven and nine, and that's the number we, we came up with. But there were early representations that because it was a commuter village, because of the way the units were, that there was going to be no impact on the It was number seven. It was number zero. It was not a fact I presented to the council and they distinctly told me there would be no children in that development. Yeah, I was there that day. So, so we, we have a difference of opinion there. Um, but we can get you those numbers. That's absolutely no problem. The other thing I want to point out about the difference between 2012 and 2022, the projections, the numbers being lower, the size of the way we're using our space and the requirements. Um, in 2012, we had uh, students in every trailer in the district. Uh, we're not doing that anymore. Um, it's not viable in this day and age to have students going in and out of the buildings into those trailers. Uh, we made a decision that that's not going to be how we're going to operate. So that is obviously a factor when you're talking about the numbers. And I applaud you on that decision. Let's get rid of the trailers. Uh, I'm just thinking because I think most of the question. Can we still play with those slides? Um, are you, though, currently teaching music out of the trailers? The only, the only trailers being used for students right now are at Lakeview, and we are teaching music in both trailers. Right, so they are being used. They are being used at Lakeview for students. The plan is to eliminate the use of trailers at Lakeview for some construction done this summer. Uh, as far as the kindergarten classes go, um, how many kindergarten classes do you have at Riverview? We have basically K, K5, we have eight sections all through the district. Five at Lakeview, three at Riverview. So five kindergarten. Five kindergarten, three at Riverview. And as far as I know, we're discussing the schools. Could you speak into the microphone? It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it wasn't working. I'm just saying, it was ringing. Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, the lifespan of the schools being 50 to 60 years old. What is the average lifespan of a school before you need to get a new school? I mean, there, there's schools that are 100 years old. It's, it's really the maintenance of the school. 
and more, more really the fact that there's no more room in the school. Plus, the, some of the, some of like a large portion of Lakeview was, was built in 2001, half the school. So, so it's yeah. Even though the main part of the building was built prior to that, and you know Valley View has additions. Riverview had an addition in the late 90s, so that it, it, you know varies. Yeah, my children were there when in Lakeview when the expansion did happen, and they were part of the largest classes they did have. Which leads me over to the to this here, and and you always have ebbs and flows with enrollment. Yes. So back in you know right now it looks it appears in 2017 to 18 you're looking probably about 350 less students now than you had back in the height which was 2007 to 2009. Um, so how do you account for that now, saying you don't have perhaps all the room that you had back then? Yeah. So. So there's two real big things. One is the way we use our space, right. meaning we now have full day kindergarten that accounted for seven additional rooms between the pre-K and the kindergarten. So there's seven rooms right there. Well, we also said there were six kindergarten classes. There's, there's eight. There's eight now. But in Lakeview, six alone. There's five. There's five. I understand right? that. They used. They only used two rooms at one point because there was only four sections of kindergarten, because when you have part-time kindergarten, many people choose not to send their kids to kindergarten, send them out, so your numbers go up in first grade. Does that make sense? So between the fact that we, we had the half-day kindergarten, no pre-K, less special ed, and the use of substandard space, meaning trailers, you talk four, four classrooms at Valley View, two at Riverview, two at Lakeview, and classes being taught in split rooms, like I showed you on that picture, and classes being taught in hallways. So those are all substandard, substandard uh, instructional spaces. What we're saying is, at the end of this year, going into next year, we will no longer use substandard space for students, but we are totally filled. As they were back then as well, and there were 350 more students. Well, also, just to add to that, you also during those peak years had things like art on the card, music on the card. I mean, you really had some really uh, inefficient, ineffective. Uh, not because you had no choice. Okay. So. Um, and one other thing. Oh, you mentioned the Lakeview Library. Um, expanding on that, not that you want to do it, but what would be done if you did? So I don't know if you've seen the Valley View or Riverview Library, but basically the same system we did in Valley View and Riverview. We're taking, because it's modern, you know, things have changed. Less, less reference books, for example. You know, not too many people look at atlases anymore. They don't look at encyclopedias. So you're able to weed some of the old books that you used to use, that people used to look up facts in, in books and don't anymore. And also desktop computers that are kind of getting obsolete. Take that space make it into classroom space in the library, actual classrooms, not, not some fake walls, but actual like walls with windows and everything. And then you create classrooms in there. By creating classrooms in the library, you no longer use the classrooms in the trailers. But you're not completely on board with that option? Is that what you were saying earlier today? No, I'm on board with it for now. It's just It just gives us no room for growth. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? I just one sort of statement and again to just clarify that and there's a fact that was put out from the administration what we're dealing with with affordable housing through the court system you know just so it's very clear the court does not care we, we completely hear all of this and I think we're equally as frustrated that this is going to be an enormous impact to our entire infrastructure of our schools. And that is not a factor. They've actually stated that does not weigh in as a factor of the schools. Maybe water and sewer, there's some opportunity for development or whatever to, to accommodate, but the school system, the court has said, is not a factor in us determining our affordable housing. I just want to be really clear because I know there's a lot of thought, well, oh, the council should just stop the development. Just say no to development. But just remember the moment that we say no to development, these interveners, potential developers, could go for a builder's remedy, and it's going to be a lot more than what this demographics, could be a lot more than what this demographic, stuff, demographic study is showing. So with the Board of Ed here, 
Um, I urge all of us, as well as the council, and I know the administration put this out, there is at least nine assembly bills sitting in the assembly right now that are not being discussed, are not being debated. That's the only way this is gonna stop. The, the court system is gonna come back and say, yeah, Deb, you're cool, you're great. Don't worry, it's not gonna happen. I urge everybody to write assembly, the Speaker of the Assembly, and, and there's a4667, S3081, A5025, about nine of them. That's the only way this is going to stop. I urge everyone to write that letter. Thanks. Ms. Um, and on top of that, the courts don't care about the impact on fire. They don't care about the impact on the police. They don't care about the traffic. They don't care about any of that. The only thing is they're going to set a number and say you're going to have to build, period. They don't care what it's doing to the town. So as Mr. Fitzpatrick said, the best thing you can do is write to these people, get on, the, you know, get on their case that they're not pushing these things through to change the whole process. All right, um, my, I'll ask you three questions if that's all right. So if I, uh, just from what I heard tonight, we are down about 350 students from 2008? From the maximum to now, correct. Okay, so we're down about 350 students, and but the need for classrooms continues to grow because we went to full day kindergarten, which did two things. It increased the amount of space we need, plus more and more students, right? right? And the need for special education and the special accommodations that we have to make is a very big driver of uh, classroom utilization, I think. Right. And cost, right? So, so those those changes really had nothing to do with development. It just that's the fact of life. Um, so we may need a new school. We may not. I don't know. But it, so um, part of it would be due to development. And there's some development. Then we'll, you know, a hundred years ago looked a little bit different than it does now. I'm sure there was some development, and uh, that was you know allowed, and that's how we we got here. Um, but not all the need for new classrooms is coming from development. It's, it's due to demographic changes, new laws that require special education, and some decisions that we make to go to full day kindergarten. That's correct. Contributions, right? Okay. All right. So, anything from the administration? Want a question or comment before we move on with the agenda? No, I'd just like to let, let the, um, the members of the board know and the public that um, the administration and the council is going to strive to uh, fight for both of the fight this as, as much as we can. We're going to protect the, the municipality from the builders remedy. We're going to try to get the number of bedrooms as, as low as we possibly can in every way that we in every way that we can. We're going to try to think outside the box and try to get as many senior units as we can, as many group homes as we can. Many, we're going to try to be as creative as we possibly can to keep the impact as low as we possibly can. Um, and uh, so, just wondering that, put on the record that, uh, you know, we will we'll be working hand in hand. So, thank you very much for coming out tonight in force with the Board of Ed and for really for partnering with us on, you know, getting better and better working together. No, thank you. And I just want to say, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we know you're in a tough spot. You know, we know these are tough decisions. Um, really, our goal, like I said at the beginning, was really to give you the information hopefully you need um, when you're looking at these so you can understand the impact. We understand it all. It's not going to stop it. I know, of course, it's not. Um, but, you know, if we can make the smartest decision we can make in terms of what those developments look like, um, obviously that helps us as much as possible. And anything you need from us in terms of information, support, we're, we're, here. we're here for that. Thank you. So we're going to go on with the regular agenda now. There will be another public portion, so you, Board of Ed, you are welcome. It's a public meeting. You're welcome to stay, but there may be some of the comments of interest. Okay, you will go close your meeting across the hall.